6, Part 3 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 6, Part 3. But I should like to know which of the governments now existing is, in your opinion, the one adapted to her. Not any of them, I said, and that is precisely the accusation which I bring against them. Not one of them is worthy of the philosophic nature, and hence that nature is warped and estranged, as the exotic seed which is sown in a foreign land becomes denaturalized, and is wont to be overpowered, and to lose itself in the new soil, even so this growth of philosophy, instead of persisting, degenerates and receives another character. But if philosophy ever finds in the state that perfection which she herself is, then will be seen that she is in truth divine, and that all other things, whether natures of men or institutions, are but human. And now I know that you are going to ask what that state is. No, he said, there you are wrong, for I was going to ask another question, whether it is the state of which we are the founders and inventors, or some other. Yes, I replied, ours in most respects. But you may remember my saying before, that some living authority would always be required in the state, having the same idea of the constitution which guided you when as legislator you were laying down the laws. That was said, he replied. Yes, but not in a satisfactory manner. You frightened us by interposing objections, which certainly showed that the discussion would be long and difficult, and what still remains is the reverse of easy. What is there remaining? The question how the study of philosophy may be so ordered as not to be the ruin of the state. All great attempts are attended with risk, Hard is the good, as men say. Still, he said, let the point be cleared up, and the inquiry will then be complete. I shall not be hindered, I said, by any want of will, but, if at all, by a want of power. My zeal you may see for yourselves, and please to remark in what I am about to say how boldly and unhesitatingly I declare that states should pursue philosophy not as they do now, but in a different spirit. In what manner? At present, I said, the students of philosophy are quite young. Beginning when they are hardly past childhood, they devote only the time saved from money-making and housekeeping to such pursuits, and even those of them who are reputed to have most of the philosophic spirit, when they come within sight of the great difficulty of the subject, I mean dialectic, take themselves off. In after-life, when invited by some one else, they may perhaps go and hear a lecture, and about this they make much ado, for philosophy is not considered by them to be their proper business. At last, when they grow old, in most cases they are extinguished more truly than Heraclitus's son, inasmuch as they never light up again. Heraclitus said that the sun was extinguished every evening, and relighted every morning. But what ought to be their course? Just the opposite. In childhood and youth, their study, and what philosophy they learn, should be suited to their tender years. During this period, while they are growing up towards manhood, the chief and special care should be given to their bodies that they may have them to use in the service of philosophy. As life advances and the intellect begins to mature, let them increase the gymnastics of the soul. But when the strength of our citizens fails, and is past civil and military duties, then let them range at will and engage in no serious labour, as we intend them to live happily here, and to crown this life with a similar happiness in another. "'How truly in earnest you are, Socrates,' he said. "'I'm sure of that. "'And yet most of your hearers, if I'm not mistaken, "'are likely to be still more earnest in their opposition to you, "'and will never be convinced, Thrasymachus least of all.' 
"'Do not make a quarrel,' I said, "'between Thrasymachus and me, who have recently become friends, "'although, indeed, we were never enemies, "'for I shall go on striving to the utmost "'until I either convert him and other men, "'or do something which may profit them against the day when they live again, "'and hold the like discourse in another state of existence. "'You are speaking of a time which is not very near.' "'Rather,' I replied, "'of a time which is as nothing in comparison with eternity. "'Nevertheless, I do not wonder that the many refuse to believe, "'for they have never seen that of which we are now speaking realised. "'They have seen only a conventional imitation of philosophy, "'consisting of words artificially brought together, "'not like these of ours having a natural unity. "'But a human being who in word and work is perfectly moulded, "'as far as he can be, into the proportion and likeness of virtue, "'such a man ruling in a city which bears the same image, "'they have never yet seen, neither one nor many of them. "'Do you think that they ever did? "'No, indeed. "'No, my friend.' and they have seldom, if ever, heard free and noble sentiments, such as men utter when they are earnestly, and by every means in their power, seeking after truth for the sake of knowledge, while they look coldly on the subtleties of controversy, of which the end is opinion and strife, whether they meet with them in the courts of law or in society. They are strangers, he said, to the words of which you speak. And this was what we foresaw. And this was the reason why truth forced us to admit, not without fear and hesitation, that neither cities nor states nor individuals will ever attain perfection until the small class of philosophers, whom we termed useless but not corrupt, are providentially compelled, whether they will or not, to take care of the state, and until a like necessity be laid on the state to obey them, or until kings, or if not kings, the sons of kings or princes, are divinely inspired with a true love of true philosophy. That either or both of these alternatives are impossible, I see no reason to affirm. If they were so, we might indeed be justly ridiculed as dreamers and visionaries. Am I not right? Quite right. If, then, in the countless ages of the past, or at the present hour in some foreign clime which is far away and beyond our ken, the perfected philosopher is, or has been, or hereafter shall be, compelled by a superior power to have charge of the state, we are ready to assert to the death that this our constitution has been, and is, yea, and will be whenever the muse of philosophy is queen." There is no impossibility in all this. That there is a difficulty, we acknowledge ourselves. My opinion agrees with yours, he said. But do you mean to say that this is not the opinion of the multitude? I should imagine not, he replied. Oh, my friend, I said, do not attack the multitude. They will change their minds, if, not in an aggressive spirit, but gently, and with the view of soothing them and removing their dislike of over-education, you show them your philosophers as they really are, and describe, as you were just now doing, their character and profession. And then mankind will see that he of whom you are speaking is not such as they supposed. If they view him in this new light, they will surely change their notion of him, and answer in another strain— who can be at enmity with one who loves them? Who that is himself gentle and free from envy will be jealous of one in whom there is no jealousy? Nay, let me answer for you, that in a few this harsh temper may be found, but not in the majority of mankind. I quite agree with you, he said. And do you not also think, as I do, that the harsh feeling which the many entertain towards philosophy originates in the pretenders, who rush in uninvited and are always abusing them and finding fault with them, who make persons instead of things the theme of their conversation. And nothing can be more unbecoming in philosophers than this. It is most unbecoming. 
for he adamantus whose mind is fixed upon true being has surely no time to look down upon the affairs of earth or to be filled with malice and envy contending against other men his eye is ever directed towards things fixed and immutable which he sees neither injuring nor injured by one another but all in order moving according to reason these he imitates and to these he will as far as he can conform himself can a man help imitating that with which he holds reverential converse impossible and the philosopher holding converse with the divine order becomes orderly and divine as far as the nature of man allows but like every one else he will suffer from detraction of course and if a necessity be laid upon him of fashioning not only himself but human nature generally whether in states or individuals into that which he beholds elsewhere will he think you be an unskilful artificer of justice temperance and every civil virtue anything but unskilful and if the world perceives that what we are saying about him is the truth will they be angry with philosophy will they disbelieve us when we tell them that no state can be happy which is not designed by artists who imitate the heavenly pattern they will not be angry if they understand he said but how will they draw out the plan of which you are speaking they will begin by taking the state and the manners of men from which as from a tablet they will rub out the picture and leave a clean surface this is no easy task but whether easy or not herein will lie the difference between them and every other legislator they will have nothing to do either with individual or state and will inscribe no laws until they have either found or themselves made a clean surface they will be very right he said having effected this they will proceed to trace an outline of the constitution no doubt and when they are filling in the work as i conceive they will often turn their eyes upwards and downwards i mean that they will first look at absolute justice and beauty and temperance and again at the human copy and will mingle and temper the various elements of life into the image of a man and this they will conceive according to that other image which when existing among men homer calls the form and likeness of god very true he said and one feature they will erase and another they will put in until they have made the ways of men as far as possible agreeable to the ways of god indeed he said in no other way could they make a fairer picture and now i said we are beginning to persuade those whom you described as rushing at us with might and main that the painter of constitutions is such an one as we are praising at whom they were so very indignant because to his hands we committed the state and are they growing a little calmer at what they have just heard much calmer if there is any sense in them why where can they still find any ground for objection will they doubt that the philosopher is a lover of truth and being they would not be so unreasonable or that his nature being such as we have delineated is akin to the highest good neither can they doubt this but again will they tell us that such a nature placed under favourable circumstances will not be perfectly good and wise if any ever was or will they prefer those whom we have rejected surely not then will they still be angry at our saying that until philosophers bear rule states and individuals will have no rest from evil nor will this our imaginary state ever be realized i think that they will be less angry shall we assume that they are not only less angry but quite gentle and that they have been converted and for very shame if for no other reason cannot refuse to come to terms by all means he said then let us suppose that the reconciliation has been effected will any one deny the other point 
that there may be sons of kings or princes who are by nature philosophers? Surely no man, he said. And when they have come into being, will any one say that they must of necessity be destroyed? That they can hardly be saved is not denied even by us, but that in the whole course of ages no single one of them can escape. Who will venture to affirm this? Who indeed? But, said I, one is enough. Let there be one man who has a city obedient to his will, and he might bring into existence the ideal polity about which the world is so incredulous. Yes, one is enough. The ruler may impose the laws and institutions which we have been describing, and the citizens may possibly be willing to obey them? Certainly. And that others should approve of what we approve is no miracle or impossibility? I think not. But we have sufficiently shown, in what has preceded, that all this, if only possible, is assuredly for the best. We have. And now we say, not only that our laws, if they could be enacted, would be for the best, but also that the enactment of them, though difficult, is not impossible. Very good. And so, with pain and toil, we have reached the end of one subject. But more remains to be discussed. How, and by what studies and pursuits, will the saviours of the Constitution be created? And at what ages are they to apply themselves to their several studies? Certainly. I omitted the troublesome business of the possession of women, and the procreation of children, and the appointment of the rulers, because I knew that the perfect state would be eyed with jealousy, and was difficult of attainment. But that piece of cleverness was not of much service to me, for I had to discuss them all the same. The women and children are now disposed of, but the other question of the rulers must be investigated from the very beginning. We were saying, as you will remember, that they were to be lovers of their country, tried by the test of pleasures and pains, and neither in hardships nor in dangers, nor at any other critical moment, were to lose their patriotism. He was to be rejected who failed, but he who always came forth pure, like gold tried in the refiner's fire, was to be made a ruler, and to receive honours and rewards in life and after death. This was the sort of thing which was being said, and then the argument turned aside and veiled her face, not liking to stir the question which has now arisen. "'I perfectly remember,' he said. "'Yes, my friend,' I said, and then I shrank from hazarding the bold word. But now let me dare to say that the perfect guardian must be a philosopher. Yes, he said, let that be affirmed. And do not suppose that there will be many of them, for the gifts which were deemed by us to be essential rarely grow together. They are mostly found in shreds and patches. What do you mean? he said. You are aware, I replied, that quick intelligence, memory, sagacity, cleverness, and similar qualities do not often grow together, and that persons who possess them and are at the same time high-spirited and magnanimous are not so constituted by nature as to live orderly and in a peaceful and settled manner. They are driven any way by their impulses, and all solid principle goes out of them. Very true, he said. On the other hand, those steadfast natures which can better be depended upon, which in a battle are impregnable to fear and immovable, are equally immovable when there is anything to be learned. They are always in a torpid state, and are apt to yawn and go to sleep over any intellectual toil. Quite true. And yet we were saying that both qualities were necessary in those to whom the higher education is to be imparted, and who are to share in any office or command. Certainly, he said. And will they be a class which is rarely found? Yes, indeed. Then the aspirant must not only be tested in those labours and dangers and pleasures which we mentioned before, but there is another kind of probation which we did not mention. He must be exercised also in many kinds of knowledge, to see whether the soul will be able to endure the highest of all, 
or will faint under them, as in any other studies and exercises. Yes, he said, you are quite right in testing him. But what do you mean by the highest of all knowledge? You may remember, I said, that we divided the soul into three parts, and distinguished the several natures of justice, temperance, courage, and wisdom. Indeed, he said, if I had forgotten I should not deserve to hear more. And do you remember the word of caution which preceded the discussion of them? To what do you refer? We were saying, if I am not mistaken, that he who wanted to see them in their perfect beauty must take a longer and more circuitous way, at the end of which they would appear, but that we could add on a popular exposition of them on a level with the discussion which had preceded, and you replied that such an exposition would be enough for you, and so the inquiry was continued in what to me seemed to be a very inaccurate manner. Whether you were satisfied or not, it is for you to say. Yes, he said, I thought, and the others thought, that you gave us a fair measure of truth. But, my friend, I said, a measure of such things, which in any degree falls short of the whole truth, is not fair measure. For nothing imperfect is the measure of anything, although persons are too apt to be contented, and think that they need search no further. Not an uncommon case when people are indolent. Yes, I said, and there cannot be any worse fault in a guardian of the state and of the laws. True. The guardian, then, I said, must be required to take the longer circuit, and toil at learning as well as at gymnastics, or he will never reach the highest knowledge of all, which, as we were just now saying, is his proper calling. End of Book 6, Part 3